guardrails. They help keep us safe. They prevent us from straying. They help guide us along the path before us. Guardrails are something that go mostly unnoticed until we need them. Regardless, they're still there, protecting us. As Christians, our faith is constantly in danger of straying off the road. In a modern world overwhelmed by sin, we must remain vigilant, aware of the path before us and the guides that God has left us. The Apostle Peter writes a letter that serves as spiritual guardrails for the church. Through these teachings, we learn how to grow in godly living. We learn how to trust God's Word. We learn how to be mindful of things that are false. And we learn to remain patient as we wait for the return of Jesus. Let us be encouraged together through the guardrails presented in 2 Peter as we grow forward in our faith for the glory of God. The first church I pastored was Spring Hill Baptist Church in rural Greene County. It was out in the middle of the country. I mean, it's an open country church. Donna and I were 28 years old when we went there. A good crowd turned out to vote on us, 22 people, and it was unanimous vote. And they were so impressed. 12 showed up the next week on Sunday morning. The good thing about pastoring a church of 12 people is you can't kill it. It's impossible to do that. But God blessed us there. We love that little church a lot. I love the people there. And by the time we came to the early part of 1993, we had tripled our size. We were running about 60 people out in the middle of the country. And again, the auditorium would maybe seat 70 to 75 people, so it was pretty full. And then I faced, as a young pastor, one of the greatest challenges I've ever had. Um, I hope I never have to deal with it again. It was, it was difficult. It was taxing. And I normally don't do this, but... I'm so committed to this that I'm going to actually put a picture of the troublemaker that brought so much trouble into our church. I'm going to put a picture of him on the screen right there. <laughs> we had a family of skunks move in under our church building. It was horrible. I'm from the Ozarks. I don't know about you, but skunks stink. And they were living underneath our church building it was February, and it was cold outside, and it, the smell was so bad, we opened up the windows in the church. People are sitting there with their coats on. These are country people. They're tough. They're sitting there with the windows open and their coats on, and after the service was over, people would be li um, leaving the building with their eyes red and tears running down their face. Are you crying? Is the spirit moving? No, it's the skunk smell. It was like burning their eyes so bad. We tried everything for a month to get rid of those crazy skunks. Uh, the Missouri Department of Conservation said, here's how you do it. You block up every entrance or exit around the building itself and leave one open. Then you buy some flour and pat out some fl uh, flour on the ground really flat and smooth because skunks are nocturnal. So go up there of an evening and you'll see the little skunk footprints going through the flour, then block up that one entrance and you've got rid of them. So we did all that. My son Dustin was a little guy in those days and it was like a big adventure to load up in my truck with the flashlights and go look at the footprints. I'm not kidding you. We would go up there and you would see the skunk footprints come out, walking in the flour, stop, do a U-turn and walk right back under the building. We didn't get rid of them. Then one of our farmers said, Pastor, there's one thing that skunks can't stand. It's mothballs. So I went and bought all these mothballs and threw them underneath that little country church building. It made it worse. Now it smelled like skunk with mothballs. <laughs> the only thing that got rid of them, uh, we finally did get rid of them mid-March, and it was by fire, uh, not our choosing. An arsonist broke into two different Baptist church buildings and burned them both down to the ground, and one of them was the church I pastored. Standing in that little parking lot of that little country church that we love so much, there were a lot of tears and it hurt watching the building burn. There was only one thing watching that building burn that gave me a little satisfaction. I was sitting there going, fry, skunks, fry, <laughs> you know, to get rid of them crazy things. People kind of wondered if I started it because I was in such a way. No, man, it wasn't me. It wasn't me. It wasn't me. There, I've learned a pastoral truth about that now these 32 years or that I've always kept with me in ministry from that day. And here's the lesson. It's bad to have skunks under the church, but it's worse to have skunks in the church. It is really bad to have skunks in the church. I stopped talking about Pepe Le Pew, little black and white fuzzy critters. I'm talking about people. 
You know, skunk is the definition for people. Here's what it means. A skunk is an opportunistic, vile, and despicable person. Today, we're going to talk about the skunk of a false teacher. You can say, oh, Pastor Kenny, I just think that's harsh. You're calling them a skunk. Wait till you see what the Apostle Peter calls them today. I'm being soft here, okay? We absolutely must not let skunks in this church, in our families, and in our lives. Part 7 of our series called Guardrails through the little book of 2 Peter is called Describing Skunks. That's our title, Describing Skunks. If you're new with us online or new with us in here, we have new people every single week. We love that. We know the purpose of a guardrail. They keep us safe. When you're driving down the road and you see a guardrail, it's going to do one of two things. It's going to keep you on the road and keep you from straying off the road where you could get to a dangerous off-limit area. Well, what's happening in the early church, believers scattered all over the Roman Empire, mainly because of false teachers, they're in great danger of drifting off of their faith, off of following Jesus, off of following the Word of God to some very dangerous, off-limit areas. So what the book of 2 Peter is, I love it so much, it's guardrails. It's spiritual guardrails that God has given us then and today to help us stay on the Jesus road, to help us not stray away from the Word of God, to keep us growing forward in our faith. And a third of this little book, all of chapter 2, is with the issues of false teachers. And I know, we're, you know, well, okay, pastor, I know if you go through a book verse by verse, you take whatever comes next, and I wish you were talking about love, or I wish you were talking about family. I mean, the topic of false teachers, I mean, come on, really, what is all this about? Well, Peter gives so much time to this, we're going to see today how hardcore serious he is about it because false teachers want to destroy our faith, want to destroy our families, want to destroy this church. False teachers, false teachings, the false teaching in our culture around us, all those things, it's kind of coming through the same pipeline here. This isn't original with me, but it's true. In the Bible, there is no greater crime than being a false teacher. It's bad to tell a lie. It's worse to teach a lie. But folks, it is flat out evil to teach a lie about God. For this church to be faithful and true, we can never, we have to have zero tolerance for false teachers and false teachings. Zero tolerance. And you're sitting here today saying, well, as I've gone through chapter 2, I realize that false teachers could be a possibility in my life. If that's what you're thinking, you've missed this chapter. False teachers are not a possibility in your life. They are a certainty in your life, in my life. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 11, that many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. False teachers and their false teaching, their false living, they claim to be from God, but they're false. They claim to speak for God, but they're false. And ultimately what it's all about is sinful man under satanic influence, is they want to pull you away from the beauty and the grace of the gospel of Jesus Christ. They want to pull you away from Jesus and his exclusivity. They want to pull you away from the Bible being 100% authoritative truth, sufficient for all things in our life. And they want to get you to follow them, their teachings, their truth, rather that's in a religious setting or a cultural setting, whatever, whatever it would be. False teachers always come up from inside of the church. I called them skunks. Jesus called them wolves in sheep's clothing. And we've seen throughout chapter 2, and it's going to be really magnified today, that basically there are not only false in teaching but false living. There are times that a false teacher may actually teach the Bible accurately, but they're using it. Their motives are false. The way they live is false to help themselves out. We'll get into that in a little bit. But we've seen throughout chapter 2, and it will be magnified today, there are basically three traits of a false teacher. It's greed, pride, and sex. Those three. Greed about wanting more money, pride about wanting more power, and sexual immorality. And what we saw the entire message last week was if these false teachers, if they never get right with Jesus, they're facing the judgment of a holy God. The guardrail for all of chapter 2, and we've got one more step to take next week. It is vital to describe and expose false teachers so you can identify them and avoid them. So today I ask you to open up your Bible we're looking at 2 Peter chapter 2, the middle of verse 10, because that's where we stopped last time. The middle of verse 10 to verse 16. Open your Bible, open your Bible app. I'm going to ask you to keep it open there, because we are going to go through each one of these verses and see describing skunks. 
And let me tell you up front, the, the Apostle Peter is fired up. He has a righteous anger. This is not some little side topic compared to all the, there's all these important topics in the kingdom, then there's this little false teacher topic. He is hardcore serious about it. He is fired up with a righteous anger. And he's going to describe them not by their appearance, because again, words, talk, actions can look a lot like just a regular Christian. He's going to describe them by their attitudes and their actions. Matter of fact, he doesn't really say anything about what they teach. He's describing how they live here. And I want to tell you, man, he is piling on. He is piling on layer upon layer upon layer, hard-hitting truth after truth after truth, hammering it home to take these false teachers, false teachings, take it seriously and identify it and avoid it in your life. This is a very, very simple message. We're just going to go through the middle of verse 10 to verse 16, just and let God's word speak to our hearts. We're going to go through it, crawl through it, if you will, and pull out all the different descriptions of the skunks, of the false teachers. Here we go. First of all, false teachers are daring. 2 Peter 2.10 says they are presumptuous. That word presumptuous means daring. You know, we like daring people. Matter of fact, it's typically our heroes. There's this real serious situation, and what's going to happen? It's tense. And in comes Indiana Jones or Luke Skywalker or someone, and they're daring and bold and brazen and fearless and confident and go into the situation and rescue the day. False teachers are every bit as daring, bold, and brazen, but not in a heroic way, but in an evil way. They daringly, shamelessly, with great confidence, false teachers have their chin held high with great confidence. They daringly, shamingly, uh, shamelessly, in great confidence, defy the word of God and defy the will of God. They are daring. Next, false teachers are self-pleasing. Again, we're just going through this, through each one of these verses. They are self-pleasing. They are presumptuous and self-willed. That word self-willed means to be self-pleasing. Basically, false teachers, false teachings, they are not God-pleasers. They're really not even crowd-pleasers. They are self-pleasers because they're so pleased with themselves. Outwardly, they act so spiritual, connected to God, and you see them ministering to other people. But inside, they could care less about the people they do ministry with. It's all about fulfilling their needs, their pleasure. They want to feather their own nest. They want to feed their own ego. It's all about them. Did you see that story in the news a few weeks ago from one of those trail cams in Boulder, Colorado, motion detected trail cam? There was this black bear who took a bunch of selfies. These are just some of his selfies. He took 400 selfies. 400. And it was wild. If you look at him, it's really funny. It's kind of like he was a model, you know, or whatever on the runway. He's like doing all these different poses and different things. And that is the exact picture of what we're talking about here about a, a false teacher. Man, they are the, they're the selfie king. They are the only one that matters in the picture. They want themselves in the picture. Oh, they may do ministry to other people, be nice, say those things, but the intent of their heart is to bring pleasure to themselves. We're just going right along. False teachers are slanderous. We're now to the bottom of verse 10. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries, whereas angels who are greater in power and might do not bring a reviling accusation the Bible says, against the Lord. Here's what we mean in verse 10, that they have no fear of God and they have no fear of speaking evil about those in authority. They will speak evil or slanderous in a church setting about the pastor, about the Bible, about church leaders. They will even speak in a slanderous way against angels. They'll speak in a, in a blasphemous way against the Lord Jesus Christ. What does verse 11 mean? Here's what it means. Angels are supernatural created beings that God created to serve and worship him. Angels have way more power and might than people. But false teachers are willing to do what an angel will not even do. False teachers will speak evil about those in authority, including angels. There's no limit who they'll talk about. Angels will not do that. Angels will not speak bad about false teachers. An angel is humble and submissive, and they know the sphere they live in, that judgment ultimately is God's territory, not theirs. These arrogant, slanderous, false teachers, they always speak evil words against anything or anyone in authority that they see as a threat to their authority, to their agenda, to their teaching. 
maybe in a, in a subtle way, sometimes out front and open, they always tear down the Bible, tear down the gospel, tear down Jesus, tear down the church, tear down all these sort of things because in doing that, they're trying to prop themselves up. False teachers are like animals, we're to verse 12. But these, like natural brute beasts, made to be caught and destroyed. Peter is saying that these false teachers, they are like out-of-control animals. Peter doesn't agree, but there is a difference between animals and people. Animals are irrational, governed by their instincts. People are rational, governed by intelligence. Unless you live in Washington, D.C., but that's another story. But animals are irrational, governed by instinct. In other words, an animal doesn't think it through. They just do it because that's what they're instinctively doing their flesh. People are to be rational, governed by intelligence. We receive revelation. We receive information. We process that information. We look at choices, consequences. We act and according to that. Peter is saying here that these religious false teachers, that they absolutely are animalistic in their attitudes and in their actions. A religious false teacher is the ultimate religious hypocrite. Because outwardly, oh, they're so spiritual. They have such a deep connection with God. And everything they say is some big spiritual sappy thing. But the Bible says inside they are driven by their carnal fleshly cravings of greed, pride, and sex. Those three things. And look what Peter said here. They're made to be caught and destroyed. Peter is not saying go out and kill people. Peter is telling us how serious it is to take an, an animalistic situation with these false teachers. I'll give you an example I think maybe will help us a little bit. In 2019, in Denville, New Jersey, the police put out a bulletin warning all the citizens. This is what they warned them about, that rabid raccoons were on the loose. There were some raccoons that had rabies, and they were very, very aggressive. Now, I want to see if you, let's say you live in Denville, New Jersey in 2019, you just hear over the TV, internet, whatever, that there are rabid raccoons on the loose. How would you, what would you, how would you act? I doubt you would say, okay, kids, just walk to the bus stop. You probably wouldn't say, sure, kids, go out in the backyard and play. No, you would be alert. We would be alert. We would be watching. And that's what Peter is saying here, that as serious that, as that is, we must take it that seriously because the only thing a rabid raccoon is good for is to be caught and destroyed. What Peter is saying here is that we should see that, a, that these animalistic, spiritually on the outside, but living life on the desires of their flesh on the inside, they're of no value to you and no value to me. We need to destroy that from our lives, not have it part of our lives. False teachers are clueless. 2 Peter 2 verse 12 says they speak evil of things they do not understand. Look, they speak evil of things they do not understand. When it comes to the Bible, when it comes to the gospel, when it comes to Jesus, false teachers do one of three things. Number one, they're ignorant about that truth. They're just unaware of it. Number two, they ignore that truth. There's two camps and they ignore the truth. One understands the truth but just totally rebels against it and, re and ignores it. The other are those who ignore it and they're not willing to investigate the Bible to see if it's even true in the first place. And the third group is they attack and scoff at Scripture because they don't understand it. They attack something they don't understand. They ignore something they don't understand. This is a great picture in this verse of a modern-day religious liberal preacher or a modern liberal religious professor who speak nonstop about God and religious things with great confidence, have so many degrees, so scholarly, and they will talk about God and about this with great confidence. They constantly drone on about God and about this and about that, but the Bible says they are clueless. Don't even understand what they're talking about. The 10th of this month, the headline in the Washington Times that the Church of England is abandoning Christianity. In a vote of 251, 181, the Church of England voted to go ahead and endorse same sex marriage, and they want to redo the Bible because they want to make the God of the Bible gender neutral. 
What is happening in that situation is they have abandoned the authority of Scripture and they are appeasing culture under the banner of political correctness. And if you look at this story and you look at the pictures, and again, there's a lot of conservatives, Anglicans and that, that's totally against this. They believe the Bible. But 250 to 181, if you look at the pictures and they're sitting around smiling and they're stained glass and they're singing and they talk about God and loving your fellow man, it all looks so great, but folks, they are clueless. They don't understand what the Bible, what Jesus, what the gospel really is all about. I know it because of 1 Corinthians 2.14, but the natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. They are foolishness to him, and he cannot, he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. False teachers are rotting inwardly. We're just, man, go Peter. I mean, he's just like absolutely piling it on here. They are false teachers rotting inwardly. Verse 12, they will utterly perish in their own corruption and will receive the wages of unrighteousness. That word perish, it means decay. It's three pictures. It's the picture of a glass of milk that is spoiled and soured. It's the picture of a plant that has withered and the leaves are crumbly and dry. It's a picture of roadkill on the side of the road that's decomposing and decaying. So again, Peter, is he's doing this over and over again. He's saying outwardly, they smile so big, they are so nice, they are so spiritual, such a deep connection with God, all these sort of things. But inwardly, if you could see what's going on inside of them, he said they're rotting and decaying on the inside. And here's why. The falsehood that they share to destroy other people's lives is in truth destroying themselves on the inside. Peter again is saying, take this seriously. He says, which one of you would ever pour a big old glass of sour milk and drink it? Which one of you would ever go out and get a dead, weathered, crumbly plant, put it in a vase in the middle of your table? Which you would ever go out alongside the road and get a decomposing piece of roadkill and throw it on the rug in your living room? He's saying in the same way, stay away from these guys. Have, Have nothing to do with them in your life in any way, shape, or form. In verse 12, in this life, inwardly, they're rotting and decaying. And in verse 13, He says in the next life, notice that word, the wages of unrighteousness. We know what wages are. He says they are earning a payday with the judgment of God. False teachers are materialistic. Those who count it pleasure to carouse in the daytime, they are spots and blemishes carousing in their own deceptions while they feast with you. Let's look at some words. The word count is a math word. How do you do math? Well, the first thing is you hate it, but how do you do math? You look at it. You've got to investigate it. You've got to calculate it. Peter is saying with that word count that these false teachers calculate and investigate what they're doing. It's intentional. Look at the word carouse and carousing. It speaks of self-indulgence. It speaks of luxury. And it speaks of super materialistic stuff. And notice it says in the daytime. In other words, this This luxury, lavish luxury, materialism, self-indulgence and things that are material, carousing, they're out in the open. They flaunt it in front of other people. They want other people to see the wealth and the riches and materialism they have. But notice the word, it's all deceptions. It's all cheat. It's all cheating and false and fake. This is probably in the United States, the single greatest false teaching inside the church is what's listed here. And we call it the prosperity gospel. Or health and wealth gospel. This is where the false teacher says this. Man, God loves you so much. He wants you healthy. He wants you happy. He wants you wealthy. You can be, matter of fact, if you really are good with God, you're going to have good health. If you really are good with God, you won't ever get sick. If you really want the best parking spot every time you go to the super Walmart, Okay, if you want wealth, wealth is a sign that God is for you. Look at me. Look at how I am living. Look how God has blessed me. He'll do the same for you. If you'll just sow that seed of faith, your blessing is coming. If you send 1999, I'll send you a statue of David slewing Goliath or whatever it is. Folks, it is absolutely heresy, and it is the sinful fleecing of unsuspecting sheep. And if you are a believer in Jesus or you're new to Christianity and you've seen that kind of stuff before, hear me carefully. That sort of prosperity gospel has nothing to do with the Bible, nothing to do with Jesus, nothing to do with the Christian life. Believers in Jesus, we are generous. We do give sacrificially, but we give for the glory of God to help other people and to further the gospel. We do not give. 
We do not, hey, support my ministry and you can be as wealthy as I am. We do not give to support private jets, mansions, Lamborghinis, and air-conditioned doghouses to some spiritual skunk. Here's the key in chapter 2. How do these false teachers get in your life and my life? How could culture, this false culture, get into your life? How, how could you be pulled away from the Bible, pulled away from the church, pulled away from Jesus in your life? How do they do that? The key is right there in verse 13, and it's easy to miss. Look at these three words, feast with you. The number one way they get into your life is through relationship, fellowship. I know people who were a part of a Bible-believing church for years. Students, they were like you. They went to discipleship weekends all fired up, man. And then they joined this crazy, unbiblical whatever. A lot of times prosperity gospel stuff. And you know what they always say to me? They're so nice. They treat us they're such good people. They're, they're, we had a problem and they were so helpful. They were right there. It doesn't really matter what they teach because they are so nice. And believers let their feelings in a relationship have more power in their life than Scripture. It's what, it's, it's what is always used is relationship and fellowship. They're so nice. They're just so, so kind. That can be in person or on TV or on the Internet. Peter is clear in identifying and avoiding these prosperity false prophets. Look at verse 13. They're a spot and a blemish. That word spot means stain. Say you've got on a bright white shirt. You're eating a French fry. You dip it and catch it. Ketchup, you drop it, and you got this big ketchup stain right in the middle of your white shirt. You're not going to go, yes, I wanted a ketchup stain on my shirt. No, a stain is unwanted. It means the stains, the spot, they're unwanted. Notice the word blemish. It looks back to the Old Testament. Whenever you brought an animal as a sacrifice in the worship of God, if it had a blemish, it was unacceptable. Unwanted stain, unacceptable blemish. Peter is saying these prosperity false prophets should be unwanted in your life and unacceptable in your life. False teachers are sexually immoral, having eyes full of adultery that cannot cease from sin. We've seen this truth over and over again as we have gone through 2 Peter chapter 2. These spiritual frauds never stop looking at the opposite sex through eyes of lust. Sometimes their teaching may even be right. Their teaching may be right, but their out-of-control cravings is never satisfied. They're always on the prowl to see who they can seduce, who they can conquer, or who they can abuse next. Throughout the history of the church, stories upon stories upon stories to today, false teachers have used ministry and position and influence in the body of Christ to satisfy and compromise their morality and their sexuality. We've seen it right here in chapter 2, fornication, adultery, perversion, and homosexuality. Some examples, I could go on forever. 40% of women at a post-cult recovery workshop had experienced sexual abuse while part of the cult. There are some men, see it over and over, the only reason they're in the church, the only reason they join ministry, the only reason they join a small group is they're on the prowl for a vulnerable woman they can try to conquer. Man, it broke my heart yesterday. I don't know if you saw national news about predators. A pastor on the staff of a church in Bentonville, Arkansas, pleaded guilty. He was sentenced to 60 years in prison. He was a pastor on that church for sexual abuse crimes against children. False teachers are good at fishing. So if some guy or gal wants you to join their Bible study and they caught a limit of crappie, don't you go. No, that's not what this is teaching. Enticing unstable souls. Unstable soul, there are some people who are just more gullible than others. I'm not mean that mean, it's just a fact. Unstable souls mean there are those who maybe with their mouth have this big commitment to Jesus, but in their life they're really not that committed to Jesus. They're an unstable soul. The word enticing is the word that makes this. It's a fishing term. Remember, the apostle Peter was a fisherman. That word enticing is the picture of using a bait to trick a fish so you can catch the fish. Really, 
committed fishermen, I mean, they are all in. They think it out. They just don't go and throw a bobber and a hook in the water somewhere. They're thinking, okay, what is the weather like today? What is the water temperature and water color? What sort of fish am I after in the first place? What depth will those fish be? What structures will those fish be on? What type of lure should I use? What size of line? What size, what color of lure? How should I retrieve the lure? Should I go fast or slow, crawl it on the bottom or buzz it across the top? They are going to think it through the best way they can to catch a fish. And that's what the word is saying here, that false teachers are that committed and that all in to try to catch you and to catch me and to catch our families. The bait they use, here's the bait that's used today. It's in gullible, unstable people. Here's the bait. I've got a new word from God. There is an experience you can have that most Christians never experience. There is a deep knowledge that only some people have. You can have freedom and fulfillment because God loves you. It's how God made you. You can fulfill whatever cravings you have in your life. Or prosperity with never any problems. And boom, they set the hook. And unstable souls are caught. False teachers are greedy. They have their heart trained in covetous practices. The word is grumadzo, that word trained. It's where we get our word gymnasium. Pretty cool word. Why do you go to the gym? Well, you go to the gym because you're going to be consistent. You want to be intense. It's intentional. You go to the gym to work out, to take care of your physical body, and to try to be healthy. What Peter is saying here, that false teachers are gym rats when it comes to greed. The earmark of a false teacher is always greed. They never have enough. They always want more. They want more recognition, more power, more money, more material, more fame, more of whatever they fleshly craving they have in their life. And just like someone works out at the gym as hard as they can to try to get results, they train and they work hard in the area of greed. Now, sometimes, again, it can be a false teacher with a false teaching who is greedy, the prosperity gospel. Support me and you'll be rich. Sometimes there's a danger here. The false teacher can have a true biblical teaching but the motive behind, the heart behind that true biblical teaching is greed. I know an example that breaks my heart. Of if, if this guy was here this morning and preached in this pulpit, you would amen. He would not say anything from this pulpit that you would, any, you would never disagree with it. But yet over a six-year period, he stole hundreds of thousands of dollars from his church. It wasn't a false teaching. It was false living. The teaching was right, but he was using his living to get the greed that he desired in his life. False children are like spoiled children. Verse 14, and are accursed children. How does a spoiled kid act? They don't like hearing no. They don't want to follow the rules. They f throw fits when they don't get their way. Every thought starts off with, I need. They manipulate and always want more. The word accursed means God's hand of destruction is upon them. God's hand of destruction is upon them. They're under God's curse if they never get right with Jesus and face his judgment. Hey, we made it. Final one is this. False teachers are dumber than a donkey. You ever look into the face of a donkey? I mean, really stare into the face of a donkey? You're not going to see Einstein, okay? Hey, this is what God's Word says. For they forsake the right way and have gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. But he was rebuked for his iniquity. A dumb donkey, dumb there means mute, can't speak. A dumb donkey speaking with a man's voice restrained the madness of of the prophet. In this final two verses of this piling on, hard hitting description of what the skunks are like, Peter goes back and pulls up an Old Testament example of the false prophet Balaam. You're going to remember, if you've gone with us through 2 Peter, this is the fourth time he's used an Old, Te Old Testament example. In verse 4, he talked about fallen angels. In verse 5, he talked about Noah and the flood. In verse 6, or 
6 through the middle of verse 10, he talked about Sodom and Gomorrah. And now he's talking about the false prophet, this sorcerer guy, Balaam. You find the story of Balaam in Numbers 22 through Numbers 24. I'm not going to go through the whole story. Basically, this is what happened. God's people, Israel, are on their way to the promised land. There is this neighbor nation of Israel, a bunch of idol worshipers called Moab. Their king is a guy named Barak. Barak hires this sorcerer, false prophet, this guy named Balaam, hires him to curse God's people, Israel. The reason, bottom line, he wanted to curse God's people then is the same reason for false teachers today, sinful man under satanic influence. It's to get mankind, get God's people, excuse me, off of God's right road and get them onto man's wrong road. If you look at Numbers 22 through 24, Balaam looks like a straight up guy out of the gate. But again, through his life, you see that it's all false. First way it's false is because He'll curse them for cash, the wages of unrighteous. He can be bought. You give him enough money, he's got enough greed in his life, he'll do whatever he needs to do. The second thing, again, I don't have time to go into all of it, but he advises the king of Moab saying, listen, I got a plan. Why don't you seduce the men of Israel with the Moabite women? In their idol worship in Moab, it involved relationships with temple prostitutes. It's always those three things, pride, greed, and sex, every time. And we see it here. And it says it's madness. Restrain the madness of the prophet. That doesn't mean that Balaam was insane. Balaam was not insane. God's word is saying it is not so crazy to go against God's word and God's will. It's madness to do that. But how did the story end? In one of the great miracles of the Bible, God used a donkey to speak and rebuke Balaam. You're saying, you mean a donkey talked? Are you kidding me? The God who made everything out of nothing, if he wants a donkey to talk, he can do it anytime he wants to. And we see that the donkey was smarter than the false prophet because the donkey obeyed God. The donkey spoke only God's word, but Balaam disobeyed God and Balaam spoke his own words and it was insanity. Okay. Let's apply all this to our life this morning. That's the description. For those of you who are not counting... I gave you a dozen descriptions. That was, so you've heard a 12-point sermon and you made it through it, okay? A dozen descriptions of false teachers. Wow. I mean, again, why not? This is, I understand it's about false teachers and, you know, we're winding down. I can't wait for a message on love or the return of Jesus and these sort of things. Why this message about false teachers? He gave a dozen descriptions. Hear me. The apostle Peter is on fire. He knows the danger of a false teacher, of a false teaching, of this false culture. He is seeing in his day the guardrails are not there. He is seeing God's people walk away from Jesus. Those who used to love the church, no longer in the church. Those living for their flesh. He's seeing this happen all around him. And he is on fire. And the application here is we need to be on fire about this too. There is a world full of dangerous doctrines. There is a cultural full of things that are against the word of God. There is a world full of spiritual con artists. Not every church is sound. Not every preacher is honest. Not every sermon is true. Not every church member is safe. I called them skunks. If I had a skunk coming at me or I had a big old wolf coming at me, I'm a lot more worried about that. Jesus called them wolves. So here, all that we've said, thanks for going along on the ride this morning through 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 10 through 16. This is the application. This is why believers in Jesus, we studied this this morning. Here it is in one question. Are you easy prey for the wolves? Could they pick you off? Could this culture pick you off? Don't answer too quickly. Are you easy prey for all that we've talked about? I've got great news. You don't have to be. That's what chapter one is all about. Chapter one, we took four messages going through, is all about knowing Jesus. It all begins with knowing Jesus as your Savior. That's the only first step. In this world with so many things counterfeit, you better make sure your salvation is the real thing. 
A relationship with Jesus who died on the cross for our sins, arose from the grave in victory, that I have admitted my sin, turned to him, Christ alone, and have received him as my personal Savior and Lord. But what the book of 2 Peter, these guardrails, is all about, it all starts with salvation. Believers, don't stop with your salvation. That's what our students have been doing this weekend. Grow in your salvation. That's what this book is all about. Don't be easy prey for the wolves. You've got to grow in your faith. Those who are new in the faith, those who have been believers for 30 or 40 years but never grow in their faith are easy pickings for this false culture, false teachings, and false teachers. But we've seen in chapter 1 that we have everything we need to grow in Jesus and live a godly life. That's what we saw in the very first message. Right now today, believers, you need nothing. You need nothing in your life to grow in Jesus. We already have everything we need. We have the Holy Spirit of God indwelling us to give us wisdom, to empower us, to guide us and protect us. We have prayer where we can call out to God about anything, anytime. We have God's voice on paper. We have the absolute truth of the Word of God that we can saturate our hearts and our minds with. And we have each other. We hold each other accountable. We love each other. We grow together. We serve together. That's why chapter 1 says, be strong in your Savior, be strong in salvation, be strong in the Scriptures, be saved. Yes, believers, grow. Keep growing in your faith. We're in this together. We want to help you. Small groups, resources. In a culture where it's hard for believers to even show up at church. It's no wonder people are getting picked off. They're just not growing in their faith. I started with a stinky story. Let me end with a stinky story, okay? Skunks, let me end. 2011, Brian Dyer lived in Lakeland, Florida. And this is his own testimony. He said, I'm just tired of driving my wife and four kids to the water park in Orlando. That's, that's all we do is we drive to the water park in Orlando. So we called a big family meeting and said, listen, I'm tired of all the trips we make to the water park in Orlando. I've got an idea. How about we put an in-ground pool in the backyard? The four kids and his wife love the idea. So they hired a pool company. The pool company came out, started digging for the pool. The backhoe started digging, and something strange happened. It hit a tire. And then the backhoe kept digging out their pool, and they hit a lawnmower. And then they hit a washing machine. Let me show you the picture. They discovered the house they lived in for five years had been built on top of a landfill. They had no idea. So on the surface, this green, lush, beautiful yard, what a place to live. Doesn't it look so good? But under the surface, there's this stinky stuff. Under the surface... There's this harmful garbage that sums up this message and that sums up false teachers. Let's pray.